This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. David Morales is an entrepreneur and has written the book American Familia, which is a dialogue between David and his sons as he shares how to escape poverty, but also find a life of freedom based on faith. You've got a, a book that just recently came out, and uh, it's, it's you've written in a unique way. When I read this, I got pulled right into it real quick. I started to feel like one of your sons, I think. I was listening to you tell the story. But give us the, the background of the, of the book that you just that just came out, American, American Familia. Sure. So the title is American Familia, A Memoir of Perseverance. Um, Interestingly, uh, as most people know, Puerto Ricans are American citizens. And so um, there is this deep sense of cultural discussions around identity. And my wife and I kept listening to it, um, especially when I got back home from a career that I left behind in part. And I started understanding why I needed to be home with my two sons. And my wife kept encouraging me, look, Young men especially need to hear your voice about the roles of fathers in the home, about your family's journey of perseverance in the United States. Let's tell that story. And so the book is really around American values, what I call traditional conservative values, faith, family, perseverance. And it's written in a way that uh, just the, the whole style of it, it's written as a father telling the family history to his two sons. That's correct. And so, look, I'm, I'm no one important. I am just another person who is a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we wanted to tell the story in a way where a father is having a conversation with two sons, two young men, and where the father could have a real interesting dialogue that people could follow and understand, especially people who are really after um, building families and trying to understand, especially fathers, how can they communicate with their children? Yeah, and you talk about in this talk about grit and perseverance and uh Coming from your, your family was actually in Indiana and then moved back to Puerto Rico. Uh, your, your father took your family back to Puerto Rico and then came back to the United States. How did that transition work for you? You were the youngest in the family and uh, lived, growing up in Puerto Rico, you had no idea that your family was, was poor or that you had an identity issue, issue as far as being Puerto Rican in, as an American citizen. That's right. So as an adolescent, I had no idea of any of these things. I had no idea that our parents were struggling. I had no idea that um, my father was an al a struggling alcoholism. I had no idea that my mother fervently prayed for my father with a very large group of women at the church. Nothing. Um, I had no idea that I wore hand-me-down clothing. It wasn't until we came to the United States uh, when I was roughly 12 years old that I discovered that materialistically I was mm -hmm. poor working class poor etc and so that was eye popping that transition for me um you know i truly believe that god has given me these this uncanny ability of self-awareness and discernment to understand my environment because even at that young age when i got to the united states i started understanding the difference between my clothing other people's clothing our families our car we had a ford pinto <laughs> that was used um and i i started observing and understanding why i wasn't dad home uh, why was mom so stressed out about finances, et cetera? So I started understanding that transition for me was powerful. I came from a place where community was very tight. In Everyone Port knew each other. In Puerto Rico. Everyone went, went next door to help each other. You didn't have sugar. That, and when I got here, it was a triple decker in New England and in in Lynn, Massachusetts. It was cold. No one spoke to each other. And it was clear, there were clear social economic divisions across streets. Yeah. Well, and, and starting into school, I mean, you started in bilingual, uh, bilingual classes. Uh, tell me about that a little bit. Is, is the awareness that comes as a, as a 12 year old finally realizing that I, I'm different than a lot of these people? I'm, it's not, I'm not surrounded by my Puerto Rican family anymore. I'm surrounded by a big multi multicultural group of people, and uh, I'm not like them. Yeah, it was interesting, Bob. I, we could spend hours on this this topic. What was fascinating for me, I'll speak to several things. First one is it was clear to me that we were separated from the English speakers. Number one, I observed that and I understood it and I didn't like it. The second thing was that the folks who discriminated against me were Hispanics. It was hilarious. It was I, I didn't speak Spanish, uh, English well at the time. 
And so I was getting really picked on or discriminated against by people who looked like me and spoke my first language. It was I- ironic. And then the third part was that there was this wonderful culture of the teachers of trying to figure out how to integrate you into the school, into mm-hmm. everyday life. But it was clear to me that I had an uphill battle of transition and adjustment. Yeah. I, I think there's uh, some people don't really understand. I've spent a lot of time in Mexico and Brazil and different places. and and. Americans or not Amer- North Americans have a tendency to lump anybody who speaks Spanish into a group of <laughs> Latinos or Hispanics. The cultures are extremely different. And oh, yes. so you're going to school with kids from the Dominican Republic. You may be going to school with kids from South America or Central America. Uh, and there's there's a there's a there's a, 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 a kind of a battle there between who's going to rise up and who's going to be kept down. Yeah, that's right. And, and look, it's even deeper than that. So at the time, um, practically, if you stepped outside of the school, we were Mexicans. Nobody knew the difference, to your point. The second part, though, that was really interesting was that on when I grew up uh, and now as a teenager, there was sort of this battle between sort of white people versus us. And frankly, it was, uh, I came to understand this in college, it was, it was, it was baseless. It was false. Um, at the end of the day, what really matters, in my humble opinion, is income, character, your ability to sort of thrive through those uh, difficult times. But at the time, there was this really clear division of sort of race, ethnicity when I was growing up. But you, you'd also mentioned the, throughout the book, uh, and it goes in from, from those early days in the bilingual uh, classes, to uh, high school and on, on into college, th- this anger that kept coming up inside you, th- was that anger developing the perseverance and the grit or was that already there? Was the, was the, the perseverance and the, uh, the resiliency uh, kind of birthed into you by God yeah. or was it developed by the anger that you felt and the injustice that you felt? Yeah, it's a great question. So first, let me say this, I truly believe that Um, the enemy, I think the devil does a really good job of, um, in our carnal sense, when we don't have Christ in our lives, um, to have all these emotions turn into sort of channeling, what I call channeling doors. For me, it was a lot of anger and frustration because of our economic situation. Frustration because I saw what my parents are going through, frustration because, uh, and partly I was insecure, etc. And then the big change for me later on in life was um, discovering that Jesus saved my life and that anger was not part of the biblical upbringing that I had been taught or that, frankly, that I, I as a follower of Jesus Christ, should embrace. And so at that time, the grit, frankly, was a combination of factors. It was a frustration about our economic circumstances. Mm-hmm. It was the streets, the upbringing that I was going through in the streets. It was third wanting to be something more than I was. Um, all those factors shaped who I was, but also drove this sort of bitterness and anger in me that I had to control, and that, frankly, football played a large part into. At the same time, I also understood biblically that it wasn't right, but there was this sort of internal battle going on with me as an adolescent. Well, what, what do you think separated you, well, not totally separated you, but from the, the, the guys you'd see on the street, the drug addicts and the guys who used to be the football stars and never went anywhere after high school and now they're out on the street and that's their life, they're the, the, they're the, the also rans. What separated you from that? What, I mean, there was something that came into your life at some point. Was it the football coach? Was it, was it just that anger? What separated you that kept you going that eventually got you to pass through that time? So I say that God plays special angels in my life, still does. At that time, I had a wonderful set of parents who would do anything for me, number one. Well, you were the baby of the family, right? I was the youngest of four. (laughs) Uh, Still am. Uh, I had incredible brothers and sisters who just loved me dearly and did anything, anything to help advance my education, etc. I had an incredible football coach who literally helped guide me uh, both on and off the field. I had incredible teachers who took a personal interest in me for no reason. And so I, I truly believe God was working in my life, even though I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. But uh, you, you, you responded to that because uh, you, do you believe in the old adage that uh, really that, that you can be anything you want to be given enough tenacity that if, if you set your mind to it, 
anybody can be anything they want to be if they work hard enough and set their mind to it. Do you believe that? I don't. I don't just believe it, Bob. I, I'm a living example. My wife's a living example. My family is an example of that. And it's not to me. It's not an added. It is truly one of the core principles of Americans. But there are there are limiting factors in everybody's life that they've got to that they have to deal with. Like I'm definitely not tall enough to play NBA basketball, even if I wanted to. There's no way I could do it. Uh, how do you get around those things that you say, okay, I want to do this? But somehow I've got to I've got to either change something in my life. I've got to change the way I respond to th things. I've, how, how do you get around those things? Sure. Well, I have I have two comments for that. The first comment is, look, God makes each of us individually special for a purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we think that this the thing we want may not be the thing that God wants for you. Uh -huh. So we have to pray deeply about that. Number two. The example of being an NBA basketball star, in my case, I thought I wanted to be an NFL football, football player. Yeah. The reality was I was good, but I wasn't NFL quality. Mm -hmm. And so over time, I started understanding that and said, okay, that's not my future. So I started thinking and praying, hey, look, God, what is my future? Help me understand where I should be going. And so there's a balance here verse, between the there's a tenaciousness, tenacity you need to accomplish something. But at the same time, you have to also seek God's guidance to understand what yeah. his plan is for you. And I, I looked as I, as I was reading your book and, you, and, and God is in your life throughout the book. I mean, your, your mom's taking you to church. Uh, your family's very, uh, at that time, uh, very religious. Even when you get into the United States, you're, 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 going, to, you're going to church at different times. When did, yeah. when did you, God come into your life to the point where you knew it was this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It wasn't just the family values and the family culture of religion, but it became life to you. Yeah, so uh, roughly around 2017 and 18, um, I was traveling a lot for work, and uh, I started hearing voices in my head, believe it or not. And I would call my wife, and uh, we, at the time, it, was, it wasn't easy. Uh, I wasn't home as much as I should have been. And I started hearing these voices that used to say, you need to be home. Your place is at home with your family and your children. And I would call my wife and say, hey, look, uh, how are you? I'm hearing this stuff. And my wife would say, we're praying for you. That's all uh, she would say. We're praying for you. Well, you remember and, your mother uh, doing that for, you remember your mother doing that for your dad. Absolutely. <laughs> and so it was um, one day, um, Honestly, it was almost like an epiphany where I just fell on my knees and just started crying and praising God. And I called my wife and I said, I want to come home. Wow. And um, I knew right then and there that my personal relationship with Christ had started in a very powerful way. Mm -hmm. And I started seeking every morning to this day since that moment. I still wake up to five in the morning and just spend time with Christ. I spend time in the Bible. And uh, that's how I live my life. What, am, what do you want from me today? And what is my purpose for you? After the break. I want my children, who I believe are my greatest legacy, to have a full understanding of their family, their history, and their future. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world.
Breaking through cultural barriers is a topic that David Morales tackles in his new book, American Familia, a memoir of perseverance. David talks about the racism he experienced towards Hispanics that came from other Hispanics. He shares how he learned to overcome this in his life. So is that, is that when the seed of the, of the book came out, is how do I translate this to my, ch my sons? How do I pass this on? That, that in, in our culture, it is, a, it is a, an oral culture where you pass things on in, in that culture. Uh, is that where the seed for the book came? 100%. Mm -hmm. um, the seed from the book is um, three parts. First is, uh, I want to make sure that my life is a living example for Christ, number one. Number two, I want my children, who I believe are, are my greatest legacy, to have a full understanding of their family, their history, mm -hmm. and their future. Their future is in Christ. We need to live for Him, and I want them to see that every day as a father. That's why I came back home. And then the third part is, there is a absolute spiritual warfare against men and against our country's values. Yeah. And I think part of, part of the book is to really elevate that discussion to say, time out. This is indeed the greatest country in the world, as long as you embrace some of the Judeo-Christian values that this country is founded on and live them, anything's possible. Yeah. And you've seen both sides of that. I mean, you get into a lot of uh, uh, Hispanic cultures, and machismo is, is a big thing. And you saw yes. that in your own family with your brothers and with your father. I've seen it in, in, in travels that I've, I've been in, in in those countries. And uh, it is a big thing. What's happened in... in I, I wouldn't say the, just the United States. What's happening in the world right now? We talk about this attack on, on men. What's happened to the idea that uh, m it's almost not cool to be masculine anymore? So, I, I, look, at the end of the day, Bob, I truly believe there's a spiritual warfare against men in this country and, and probably across the world. Um, I don't know how we got here. I can't speak mm -hmm. to that. But what I can speak to is the following. Number one... In African-American homes, uh, over 80% of those homes don't have a father. In Hispanic families, over 60% don't have a father. Um, that's concerning. When you take out the male role figurehead from a family, from a home, the end result is what we have today, violence, depression, etc. Number two, what I can tell you is that machismo in Latin America, still very much alive in some places, in some countries, even here in the United States, um, there, there needs to be a teaching, and this is part of what I tried to do in my book, American Familia, there is a teaching that we as men who Christ has saved, we need to teach our children, mm -hmm. it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to have a wonderful relationship with your wife. She is your equal. She is your partner. It's a wonderful thing to be able to say, I accomplished something by the grace of Christ, right? And so we have to teach that as a Hispanic man who grew up around some very extremely strong men, mm -hmm. it's now my job to teach back what that looks like from God's perspective. And then the third part is, look, at the end of the day, I'm not sure as a country we could have ever achieved what we've achieved without men in the home and in important places. So it's on us to speak about that and to really show a different side of the sort of quote-unquote anti-male masculinity agenda. A little, little personal note, since you made that decision, I mean, made your decision in your life to kind of get off the road and get back to the family, uh, you've got two sons. Uh, what, how, how have you seen the effect? Night and day. <laughs> a night and day. Before, uh, when I wasn't around much, my children were, uh, were not as outgoing. Um, having some challenges uh, here and there at school, uh, having clearly some challenges with my wife. Um, and um, today, uh, I am blessed by two of the most caring, confident, strong uh, young men, uh, sons. It is powerfully different. And I just give God all the glory for that. Now, I, as I read through the book, and this is kind of an inside question for the author. So I'm reading through the book. You're telling the story to your sons. Your wife is in, kind of in and out at different times. She's coming into the room as you're telling the story. Did you, have you told that story to your sons? Are they going to read it in the book? Or have you set them down at different times and gone through this with them? Yeah, we have not read the book together, but interestingly, they heard a lot of the writing of it. Mm -hmm. um, they, I mean, I would speak often about the experiences. I would sit them down when I was interviewing my parents 
uh, my brother's sisters, they heard a lot of it. Um, and so from that point of view, it has given them a whole different perspective mm -hmm. on our entire family, not just my upbringing, but about my father. Um, I discovered new things about my parents with my sons, about my parents that none of us knew. Yeah. And so it's been a wonderful journey of discovery for them as well. Well, it, it is amazing. I mean, you look at the look at the book American Familia, but at the same time, you're you're really a Renaissance Renaissance man. I mean, you're you're a singer, you're a big collector of of historic and and uh, contemporary po uh, Puerto Rican music. You're also an executive, but you and your wife have uh, your wife has been coming to you with some ideas lately, and one of those is a is a new nonprofit that yeah. uh, uh, really could make a difference in a lot of families' lives. Absolutely. So first and foremost, my wife, Samantha, is a rock star. She is the backbone of our family. Um, so aren't, they, aren't most wives that way? <laughs> 100%, my friend. 100%. Um, so we launched an organization. Uh, it's a 501 to 3 social enterprise, and it's called AORA. A-H-O-R-A -A means now. Uh, you can find it online, www.aoramoney.org. So the premise was very simple. Again, my wife's idea. We have a lot of family that have struggled financially for years. We, by the grace of God, were able to learn how to use our money. She was investments for 20 years, uh, learn how to use our money to grow money. Mm -hmm. And so the premise was simple. She said to me one day, David, God wants us to help others do what we did. Self-reliance, empowerment, um, and learn how to use our money to grow money. I'm, we're going to go teach others. And another big idea, I said, Samantha, that's a big idea. How do we do that? <laughs> yeah. So we started building an organization that does two things. Financial coaching available 24-7 with real experts like her. And then separately, uh, in concert, a financial health and budgeting tool, mm -hmm. very easy to use online, that you, along with the coach, can use or you can use on your own time. But what it does, it, it teaches you the discipline to think differently about consumerism. We're taught to spend, Bob. Mm -hmm. We should be taught to save and to grow our money. The Bible says grow, right? And so that's partly what we're doing here. We're trying to teach Americans to s build self-reliance and learn how to use their money to build wealth as opposed to be dependent on government. When we hear words like uh, uh, money growth or wealth money management or, or wealth growth, things like that, we're thinking, normally we're thinking of very, very wealthy people who need a financial manager to help them manage that wealth. And you're not talking yeah. about those people. You're talking about ordinary people who just really need to get, to get things together financially. That's right. That's right. As you know, there's for wealthy folks, there's wealth manager. Great. Mm -hmm. For middle class Americans, working class Americans, there's nothing. Right? There is, there is your bank. Well, the bank is one tool. What mm -hmm. we need is the financial learning, the understanding of how money works, so we can both understand discipline toward money, but also understand how to grow that money, regardless of your income, by the way. Regardless, because we started with nothing. Yeah, and I've, I've known, well, there's people in, in families that I've known that they just, have, their, their mentality is, I'm poor. It's like poor mouthing. I'm poor and I'll always be poor. And, and this is how my family, this is the, the identity of my family. Can people get out of that, that, that whole mindset of the difference between poor and poverty? Absolutely. 100%. What, what is the Look, yeah. So from my point of view, um, poverty is a mindset. Mm -hmm. Poor is a situation. If you have a, a, a position in your mind where you're saying to yourself, I'm poor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's on you. That's a mindset challenge. Mm -hmm. The situation of being poor financially, well, we can overcome that. But we've got to have certain patterns and behaviors that we need to learn to change that circumstance. It starts here, Bob. Mm -hmm. If you tell yourself you can't do it like anything else in life, you won't do it. But if you change the mindset and say, okay, time out. How do I address the circumstance that I'm in? Whether it's I need an educational degree, whether it's I need to start a company, whether it's I'm going to work three jobs for the first 12 months so that I can earn enough value to start something different or to invest. That's a mindset. It's a decision we as individuals need to make. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's uh, again, the, the nonprofit is AORA, which means now, right? That's correct. A-O-A-H-O-R-A. -A -A. How do people get in, in touch with, with AORA? Sure. It's easy to find. www. 
uh, odamoney.org. It's online and there will be a financial person available to call you. The interesting part is that whereas um, other services that are for profit charge you a lot of money on a monthly basis for support, Aura charges a very low amount monthly because the goal is not to make money for Aura. It's to empower Americans to build their wealth. So the monthly subscription is very low. Okay. And then also a, a new podcast you've got out, uh, Machine Grit DNA. <laughs> it's uh, Grit Machine DNA. Oh, Grit Machine, DNA. okay. Grit Machine, grit DNA. Machine DNA. And you just launched that, right? We did. That was, uh, man, when I was in high school, my football coach, David Dempsey, who is uh, still in my life, one of the greatest men I've ever met. Um, that was one of the things he coined for me. He's like, we're going to build Grip Machine DNA when I was in high school. And we sure did. But uh, we launched a podcast in January. Uh, it's uh, it's very simple concept, Bob. What we're trying to do is to show America what true wonderful leadership, humble servant leadership looks like mm. and what's possible. On TV, we see wonderful sports figures and athletes. That's great. But your neighbor next door could have been a World War II generation leader hero, right? Your neighbor next door could be the mailman who had an incredible career doing X, Y, Z and now is delivering your mail. Uh, your neighbor down the street could have been an executive as a woman who accomplished remarkable things uh, despite challenges. And so we're trying to show people across America that, yes, there are average Americans, quote unquote, that have done remarkable things in their lives that can serve as examples for us to live faith, family and grit as core principles of our, of our DNA. And they can find the podcast. Where can they find the podcast now? Now that it's up and running. The podcast is available on online. So Buzzsprout, Spotify, mm -hmm. uh, Grit Machine DNA, just Google or go to okay. Spotify. And we're up and running. And again, the book is American Familia. Uh, it's been great to have you with us, David. I love the book. And uh, I'm going to go back and read the epilogue now. Yes, please do. Thank you, Bob. It was an honor to be with you. You can find American Familia, a memoir of perseverance, on Amazon. Viewpoint is made possible by the support of viewers just like you. We're just one of the many outreaches of WTLW and the Axe Foundation. You can find out more about us and watch more episodes on demand at WTLW.com. Thanks for watching. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gift so we can continue to produce more programs.